Good, good afternoon, happy new year, and welcome back to Bowdoin. I'm Ann Collins Goodyear, and together with my co-director, Frank Goodyear, and on behalf of the whole staff of the Bowdoin College Museum of Art, it is a pleasure to launch our spring program this afternoon. Today, today we have the great pleasure of gathering for an opening presentation which inaugurates our new exhibition, Distant Mirrors, Reflections on Painting. It will be followed by an open house celebrating all of our newly unveiled and continuing winter exhibitions. These include, of course, not only Distant Mirrors, but also Descent in 1960s America, the photography of Ken Thompson, together with To Count Art, an Intimate Friend, and Earth Matters. Our spring calendar has recently been released. You'll find copies of it just outside the auditorium, as well as at our wonderful bookshop, and everything included in this beautiful publication is also readily available online. We encourage you to study it closely, because you'll find information in here about an extraordinary wealth of offerings, a program of lectures, gallery talks, musical events, exhibitions, and many other fabulous programs. We hope to see you at the museum early and often. If you haven't already done so, we also want to encourage you to join the museum, which offers a free membership and to be part of the art. Membership is the best way for us to stay in touch with you about our ongoing programs and about lots of emerging special opportunities. It is now my pleasure to welcome to the podium the Bowdoin College Museums of, Museum of Art's fabulous uh, curator and uh, collaborator um, with the two women from whom you will hear shortly, Joachim Homan. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. I'm so glad uh, we are here for the beginning of a new semester and a semester of rich programs. It's my special pleasure to introduce you to two artists actually, to one painter, one poet and scholar who have worked together on a really exceptional exhibition which in spite of its small gallery space that we allotted to it, has a lot to offer, a lot of uh, thoughts and um, uh, beauty um, that, that we are going to explore later after this lecture. It's very rare I actually have never even encountered it before this project started, that you walk into an old master gallery and it smells like fresh paint, <laughs> fresh oil paint. And that's exactly what's ha what happens here when you enter the Markel Gallery in a space that's usually reserved for the old masters. Uh, Bowden's collection, as you all know, um, includes works from the 17th and 18th centuries, 16th, 17th and 18th centuries, and one of the works that we were fortunate to add relatively recently to our collection is Dennis Calvert's Annunciation, a gorgeous piece that was uh, very, very beautifully, elegantly painted on a very smooth copper ground by an artist who was one of the outstanding talents of his generation at a moment when Renaissance and Mannerist art were um, at its highest and uh, the seeds for the future of Baroque art were just laid, a really fantastic moment in art history uh, that I would love to talk about more, but it's not our topic tonight. <laughs> Dennis, Calvert, Dennis Calvert was uh, with his enunciation not only able to present a really uh, gorgeous and, and meaningful rendering of a biblical story that has been told in many, many um, images already in the history of art, but he was able to also propose to um, artists who were his students a way of, uh, of making art meaningful for his, his generation. He was a very accomplished teacher as well as a painter and founded a school in Bologna that was attended by many of the great 
artists of the next generation. So it's wonderful to consider this work that's here at Bowdoin from the, an artist's perspective. And that's exactly what we are doing. Uh, Elise Ensel, a contemporary artist in Portland, Maine, encountered the work uh, by um, Dennis Calvert as recently as the last fall. And we, when we were talking about an exhibition of her work for Bowdoin, she at first had selected a whole range of her paintings from the last years that uh, often riff off old master paintings. And she offered to paint one work from our, uh, to paint new work based on um, a work from our collection that would complement works that she had already created in the past. And as she was immersing herself into the work, into the Calvert painting, she found a treasure trove of ideas to which she could relate and um, a new um, inspiration for a whole series of work. So the conversations that we had over the last um, weeks were like this. Oh, let's put one rendering of the Calvert painting in a contemporary idiom into this show. Oh no, let's make it two, let's make it three. And it kept going until we made the decision to make this exhibition solely about um, Elisa's responses to the Calvert painting, which is great. The one who initiated the whole project was Haneta Vite Congolo, who, um, as a Bowdoin professor of French and Francophone literature, uh, was a member of the Studies in Beauty Initiative, a Mellon Foundation funded humanities cluster that dedicated itself to the studies of ethics and eth excuse me, eth aesthetics. And um, out of conversations in her own field of study, uh, she then um, invited Elise Ensel on a co collaboration on a show which you're seeing today. I'm really proud to uh, introduce both of these collaborators to you tonight because both of them have to offer uh, inspiring perspectives on the old masters, as you will hear. Let me just say a few words about um, both speakers before first Elise will present us with an overview of work from recent years and then Haneta will respond with a few comments um, about this particular show and the theoretical underpinnings of Elise's work. Elise was born in New York City, received the BA in Comparative Literature from Brown University in 1984 and while in uh, Providence, Rhode Island also studied at RISD, she earned her MFA at the uh, Visual Arts Department from Southern Methodist University in 1993. Elise has exhibited in many places in the United States and in Europe. She's either always just going to London or coming from London when I speak to her and has amazing successes there in the, um, with exhibitions. And uh, most recently, she exhibited at Cadogan Contemporary in London, but she also had shows at Phoenix Gallery in New York and Ellsworth Gallery in Santa Fe, all of whom present her work. Um, the list of exhibitions in which Elise participated is very long. I want to mention just the Royal Academy in London and the Parish Museum in New York, uh, uh, in New York State on Long Island as some of the venues that have exhibited her work. The uh, exhibitions in Maine are relatively slim and uh, I'm really proud to show Elise's work here. Hanita Vita Congolo is the Associate Professor of Romance Languages and Literatures here at Bowdoin. She's a specialist for Caribbean and African ideas, cross-cultural feminist theories, Francophone women's literature from West Africa, and topics of literary theory and post-colonial theory. She re received her doctorate at the Université des Antilles et de la Guyane in Martinique, and um, uh, studied there also for, for other degrees. And um, the list of publications that Haneta features on her website is so long, and the titles are all in French. Do you want to hear them? <laughs> <laughs> I think that you should take note that um, 
uh, there is a wealth of publications that Hanita uh, published as a scholar of um, literature in the Caribbean and of oral traditions in the Caribbean and that she's a particularly well versed um, as a um, scholar of women's literature and matters of identity which she interprets uh, in this context. Besides being a scholar, she's also a very accomplished poet who is publishing um, around the globe in Europe and, uh, and here in the United States. Um, and so she has a lot to offer. Her classes here at Bowdoin range from uh, classes on Francophone cultures, voices of women, voice of uh, Jewish and black figures in French texts, and others. She has spoken at many, many conferences, and it's just a great treat to have you both here. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm looking forward to your presentations. Welcome. Thank you, Joachim, for that lovely introduction. And first of all, I would like to extend a deep and heartfelt thanks to Anne and Frank Goodyear for this remarkable opportunity. It is very, very exciting to have my work in the Bowdoin Museum, and particularly thrilling to have it in the Markell Gallery, where it can be in conversation with the museum's old master collection and ancient collection. Uh, I would also like to thank Joachim, send Joachim a huge thanks. It has really been an honor to work with a curator of his level of talent and intelligence. And the whole process has been very energizing, inspiring, and fun. Um, and finally, the deepest and most heartfelt thanks of all to Annette Bette Congolo, without whom this exhibition would not have happened. Um, it is really an honor to contribute in whatever way I can to this very important work she is doing in exploring the relationship between ethics and beauty. And um, when Annette first approached me about showing some of my paintings uh, in relationship to the Studies in Beauty initiative and that course cluster, I don't think either of us could have foreseen um, the form that this collaboration would take. And I'm absolutely thrilled in the form that it has taken. So. Uh, all right, I am going to talk to you for about 15 minutes about my work, and then Aneta will discuss how the ideas that are in my work relate to the study in ethics and beauty. Uh, my work involves translating historical imagery into a contemporary pictorial language. Uh, so what you're looking at here is Goya's painting Truth Rescued by Time, Witnessed by History, and then my painting of the same title, um, or actually I shortened mine to Truth Rescued by Time uh, on the left. And of course, what you're looking at is actually not a painting by Goya or even a painting by myself, but a digital projection of a digital photograph. And in a sense, my work ha really represents an ongoing dialogue with the medium of photography not as it's practiced by artists, but as it is practiced um, in advertising, print media, television, and commercial cinema. And um, in all of those media, there's a quality where photography presents itself as objectively realistic, and, or objectively truthful and realistic. And, while we all know that it's not, and you know, even middle school students now know that any photographic image they see has been photoshopped and doctored, it still continues to be a pervasive influence um, in the way women are pictured and in the way they picture themselves. And my approach to um, contending with some of that was to seek refuge in the world of painting. So my approach in painting or the, uh, the contemporary pictorial language that I try to translate my images into is very much involved in abstraction, material specificity, and interrupting the linear narrative. Um, and you can see that in this painting, I have literally turned my painting upside down so that the image that I'm working, that I'm creating, is emptied of any residual narrative or representational content. Uh, when I started painting, 
I was interested in working from nature. And so these are what you're looking at here are abstractions from nature. The painting on the left, which is titled Vine, uh, was not done by looking at a vine, but is really more of an abstract evocation of vines and water. Um, the painting, I guess, is that, or maybe it's the painting on your left? Your left, my, yeah. the painting on, now I'm really confused. Okay, <laughs> the painting on my left, your right, is uh, a painting I titled Bridge. And Bridge was painted in my studio in Fort Andros, right here in Brunswick. And it is a painting anchored in a specific and concrete um, visual experience. However, it is not a plein air painting of the bridge in the river that was seen out of my studio, but a plein air painting of a photograph of the bridge in the river. Um, then I became interested in layering multiple sources in single images. So now what you're looking at is the, um, an abstraction of nature layered over and interwoven with abstractions based on the Sibyls by M Michelangelo on the Sistine ceiling. Uh, on the left, no, wait, right. Um, on your left is the Erythraean Sibyl, and on your right is my abstract interpretation of the Libyan Sibyl. And in case you are not able to immediately call the Sibyls to mind, here they are. Um, the Erythraean and the Libyan. Stunning, beautiful, amazing paintings. And so beautiful, in fact, that at that point, I began to think, you know what, instead of layering multiple images, I simply want to work, do a direct translation um, from a source. So um, I began doing that, and here we have Tiepolo on the left, and then my interpretation on the right. You can see again that I've turned my painting over to again emp empty it out of any narrative content and to um, make the painting as radically abstract as I could. Another painting I painted at the same time is based on Titian's Tarquin and Lucretia. Again, it's a very abstract image and again turned upside down to empty the painting from, to rid the painting of any residual narrative or representational content and to appear more real in the sense that the reality at this point of what you're looking at is simply the material fact of the paint and shapes and colors without a linear or narrative read. Um, and part of the reason I did that is because the linear narrative read of the Titian was so disturbing that I wanted to preserve what was beautiful in that painting while not necessarily in any way supporting the, in, this graphic image of violence against women. Um, in the two paintings that you've just looked at, I ran into what has continued to be a fundamental problem for me as a painter uh, in that when you're translating historical imagery or old master imagery from the Baroque and the Renaissance, you're either encountering Christian iconography or mythology, and in many cases the mythology does depict certain, you know, a certain degree of violence. Um, so as a artist of Jewish descent, I felt very much on the outside of the narrative of the Christian iconography, and as a woman, I felt sort of offended by the violence. And at the same time, I have to say that Titian is an incredible painter, and so I wanted to celebrate what was strong in his work while at the same time um, deconstructing what I found to be offensive. Um, this is a painting I did after Ang's um, portrait of the Comtesse de Haussonville. This is a gorgeous painting by Ang that's at the Frick Museum in New York. And um, the Comtesse de Haussonville was a very uh, highly intelligent, highly intellectual woman who, who uh, published several novels within her lifetime and was also known as a political um, force. And, so I found it interesting that Ang painted her as, as such a like coquettish um, beauty, like she almost looks stupid in this. And so I, um, I wanted to reconstruct that painting. This is more representational than I usually am, but I wanted to sort of shift the meaning slightly, not as radically as I had done with the Titian, but just shift it slightly and create a, a sort of uh, more thinking woman's version of the same portrait. Um, 
well, I will admit that even my portrait has a sort of blank stare and almost a little existentialist edge. Um, here we come back to Titian. These are, uh, this is the Bacchanal of the Andrians by Titian on the left. And uh, Titian did a series of Bacchanals um, for the, a room that was called the Alabaster Chamber. Um, they were commissioned and they're beautiful paintings and I wanted to take them on and I wanted to um, explore how their sort of celebratory and chaotic energy could exist within the lexicon of contemporary painting. Uh, and then here is Titian's Bacchus and Ariadne, another Bacchanal, um, w which I felt really lent itself to the sort of riot of paint that can be, do can be used when you're working in a gestural and abstract manner. Um, and here's the final Bacchanal. This painting was actually painted by Giovanni Bellini. The figures were painted by Bellini, and then Titian, who came after Bellini, uh, created considerable um, additions to the landscape. Uh, so it's sort of a collaboration between the two of them. And then my painting, um, my interpretation of that Bacchanal, in which I'm really trying to have a sense of the Bacchanalian energy and celebration and vibrancy. Um, this painting was selected to be in the summer exhibition at the Royal Academy this summer. And so here it is. And in the foreground is this beautiful, huge sculpture called Cork Dome by David Nash. And then to the left of my painting was a beautiful landscape by Jock McFadden, who was the artist who curated that room. And the subject of the room was radical landscape, or, you know, sort of, I, I guess it was the idea of what are different ways to picture the landscape or to picture nature. Um, the same painting, the year before, had been, along with the Titian, one of, I did, I actually did many versions of, or many interpretations of both um, the Bach, Titian's Bacchus and Ariadne and the Feast of the Gods. And in fact, usually when I work, I, I do multiple versions. Um, and these paintings, these three paintings were in a wonderful exhibition in Long Island in New York um, called the Artists Choose Artists Exhibition at the Parish Art Museum. The Parish Art Museum is a gorgeous museum. It's uh, it was designed by Herzog and Dumeron, who are the same architects who designed the Tate Modern. And it's like filled with light and designed to echo the potato barns that were in the fields out in Watermill, Long Island in that area. On the top is an, another installation shot and you can barely make it out, but on the left of my paintings are two paintings by David Sally, who was an artist who was very influential to me when I was first starting to paint. Um, and so it was, it was a lot of fun to be next to his work. The artist who actually selected my work for that exhibition is Mel Kendrick. Um, Mel Kendrick is a sculptor, and his work really, upon first glance, doesn't seem to have bear much relationship to my work. But I found it very interesting. A reviewer who uh, reviewed the Paris show uh, talked about how both of our work, um, uh, how do I say this? Both of our work maintains an echo of the cause of its own inception. So in my case, that's the, the old master painting is always there underneath. And in um, Kendrick's case, what he does is he takes a geometrical solid, he hollows it out, and then the form on top of it becomes, if not literally what he hollowed out, a form that relates to that, so that it, again, rests on the echo of its own inception. Um, by interesting coincidence, Mel Kendrick has a many centuries old relationship to the state of Maine. I think his family's been going to Deer Isle since the 1700s, as far as I can tell. Um, this is another, since this is another artist, I guess now that I've moved into artists who have influenced a relationship, I wanted to take a moment to talk about artists who have influenced me. Um, many people see my work as related to abstract expressionism, and that certainly makes sense given my given my language of gestural abstraction or my idiom of gestural abstraction. However, really my work owes more to artists working in Europe today. So this is Gerhard Richter, um, who's a tremendously important artist to me. And these are two paintings that he did that were based on the Annunciation, on Titian's Annunciation in the Church of San Salvador in Venice. Um, this is, 
Titian has, not Titian, Richter has done several interpretations of old master paintings, although it's not the central body of what he does. But seeing these helped me to feel that interpreting old master paintings could be very much the subject of serious contemporary painting. Um, two other artists who have been extremely important to me are Per Kirkaby, who is on your left, and Frank Auerbach, who's on your right. Um, the, the Kirkaby painting, and I guess in Danish it's pronounced Kirkabu, that painting is actually in the Bowdoin Museum, and you'll see it as you are um, going to see the um, exhibitions in the museum this evening. And um, Kirkaby, I'll just call him Kirkaby, uh, he has, <laughs> he's been tremendously important to me because of the way that he abstracts from nature. Um, it's very politically incorrect to talk about race and ethnicity, but I will say that my mother is Danish and my father is Jewish, and these two artists um, are of the same um, ethnic or cultural descent, and even though I didn't want to take the time to show their influences, I, I think that there is a, a um, connection to this very gestural, very luscious, and very emotive way of working that um, is specific to this cultural identity. Um, Frank Auerbach's painting is rooted in a specific perceptual experience. And one of the reasons he's so important to me is because he really influenced me in this idea that while abstraction is important, it can be very important to ground it or anchor it in, in a specific experience of the real world. Another interesting thing about Auerbach is that he really didn't sell any paintings until he was in his 50s. So I felt like he was a really excellent example of um, you know, continuing to work hard and persevere in your studio, um, irrelevant of critical response or irrelevant of certainly celebrity or exhibition opportunities. Now, however, he's in, an incredibly sought-after painter, and he, his work at this moment is in a um, quite stunning retrospective at the Tate, lifetime retrospective at the Tate Britain. I wrote to Frank Auerbach, actually, because he had, he had done an exhibition called Painting After, After the Masters, and um, that, the exhibition catalog for that was very influential to me, so I just wrote him a quick letter thanking him for his influence, and I never expected to hear back from him, but I did, and what I got back from him was the Vermeer, was a postcard with this um, painting by Vermeer. And um, at first I thought, oh, that's, you know, so considerate. He's giving me, showing me an image of a woman that's, um, you know, got her clothes on, and she's uh, <laughs> engaged in constructive, creative, intellectual activity. Um, and, and I was just holding it, holding it, thinking that. And then all of a sudden, a sort of light bulb went in my head, and I thought, oh, this painting is the key to what I'm doing. And the key is the geometry. And, it, you know, as you can tell, Vermeer is an incredibly geometric painter, so that the geometry becomes an architecture on which to hang all of the very gestural, visceral, luscious paint um, that, I like, that I like to use in a very emotive kind of style. Um, so in attempting to, um, or let me say this, I guess, in thinking these thoughts, I thought, oh, you know, I really ought to try to work from this painting. If he's taken the time to send it to me, I'll take the time to try to do a painting from it. And when I tried to do a gestural painting from it, and I really couldn't. I re it was a, just a mess, and I got lost. Um, so I thought, all right, I'll just stop, and I'll do something I never do. I picked up a ruler, put some straight lines in my paintings. I, I found the vanishing points, which interestingly in this painting are really at the woman's heart. And um, I did not what I would consider an original piece of artwork, but just a very careful analytic study of the composition and the color and the uh, final Analy you know, the final stage of the analytic study is there on your right. And um, then, once having done that, and once having analyzed and really carefully deconstructed the painting, I then felt free to abstract it and to work in my usual, more gestural lexicon. So these are a couple of abstractions I did from it, and here are a couple more. Um, and what you can see here is that I, it was not, it didn't, my paintings did not involve a straightforward and linear trajectory towards abstraction, which is an idea 
promulgated by Clement Greenberg, but rather a crossing back and forth over the border between abstraction and figuration in the search for something fresh, energizing, and invigorating. Um, and those paintings were exhibited this past December in London at, at an exhibition, the title of which was Fusion of Horizons. The term Fusion of Horizons is a term I learned at a dinner party here in Brunswick with Glenn, uh, Glenn Wallace, who used to teach in the philosophy department, introduced the idea. And it's an idea that, that um, was put forth by Hans Gadamer, a German philosopher. And the idea is simply that nothing, and he's talking about texts, but I, I extend this to paintings, that no text or painting can be knowable without the fusion of the horizons of the bias of the painter or writer and the viewer or reader. Um, and it is this fusion in which um, prejudices are overcome and new ground um, begins to become possible. Um, also in this exhibition were a series of paintings I call transcriptions. Um, and in these paintings, I stopped working from other artists' paintings and started working from my own small paintings. So what you're looking at now are two very small paintings. And then I, um, using Renaissance methods, a grid and a grid, scaled them up. So um, here we have the Dejeuner sur l'herbe first, you know, in, this, in the previous slide in my small painting and then my painting of my own painting. So this idea of translation and transcription is very much um, informed by my own background in comparative literature. Um, and here, again, is the final large transcription painting in which I took the painting that I showed you at the very beginning of this lecture, uh, which came from Titian's Tarquin and Lucretia. I, at this point, let it be right side up again, and, um, and it was the scale that caused um, elements that could once be decoded as representational to now be read as um, broadly atmospheric. Um, so having introduced the idea of my background in comparative literature, I think I will now turn this over to Annette Vente Canglo, who can more um, clearly discuss literary theory. I'm not sure how to turn this off, but. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. It's my pleasure to um, be welcoming you on behalf of the Studies in Beauty Initiative. Um, I also want to take a few minutes to thank uh, the Museum of Art and the directors, Anne and um, Frank Goodyears, and especially uh, Joachim, who went above and beyond to put this um, event together. Thank you very much, uh, Joachim. So Elise has introduced to you um, the thoughts and rationale behind her um, action, her, this, this action and, and performance she does through painting. And I'm going to try to relate to it um, from my angle, my perspective, which is actually my uh, scholarship actually uh, is, the, is in, in this field of study that is um, currently called uh, African um, uh, critical theory or black existentialism. And it is from that perspective that I am going to um, uh, try and relate uh, to Elise Ancel's um, um, painting. So the very conceptualized framework, process of creation and concrete rendition of Elise Ancel's artwork compel attention. She offers a forceful body of painted work largely participating to the contemporary world discussions about itself, its possible meanings and possibilities. Elise found her act of painting in recreating, revisioning, and representing paintings that were created at a time when women were seen as other to create meaningful, self-conceived, and affirmed ontological speech and discourse. In, in that, uh, her creation perspective is on ideation, which by nature is already as generative as it is regenerative. The least that one can say is that 
Elise's act of painting neither compromises on the visual quality of her finished work, nor honors any art form, art for art's sake, stance or practice. It is not part of a simple pictorial recycling trend and posture, crediting Lavoisier's maxim that nothing gets lost, nothing is created, all things get transformed. Rather, Elise means to consciously point to, critically suggest, or draw attention to aspects of the human life not conven conventionally acknowledged or that are generally decrypted through unestablished, domineering, and exclusive lens presenting itself as uniquely objective. It is to be stressed that Elise does not achieve her goal through the crude imposition of her abstract perception. Her paintings are the concrete expression of a soul in dialogue with predecessors and in utterance of an intrinsic voice and a perception. By methodically selecting paintings by old European masters' paintings, and given the history of marginalization and voicelessness endured by European or Euro-descended women in the European or European-like context, Elise enhances even more the new woman's lens she now posits as an authoritative and viable decryption perspective and mechanism, relying on the symbolic, ideological, political, and philosophical, therefore, her artistic complex also stands as testimonial and akin to the European feminist tradition. Drawn from the pre-existent to allow for the legitimate expression of more existences, to widen the scope and meaning of alterity, to include the unheard, the unseen, or simply the effaced or discarded, Elise's artistic approach also translates a sort of Nietzschean perspectivism, and its progressist nature is in that highly striking. In our today's world, where the local, the regional, and the global are electronically brought to the fore and conflate with an alacrity and a density, both susceptible to trigger and exacerbate as much rapprochement as estrangement and confusion, and discern uniformism and factitious uniqueness, knowledge and ignorance, awareness, inclusion and exclusion, enlargement and sh shrinkage at the same time, as well as aberration and dispersion. Elise's act of painting appears as an inner centerizing proposition, itself bearing the characteristics of an alternative. From this already, she introduces the critical notions of ethics and raises the very issue of the painter's identity as it enmeshes with the articulations, meanings, values of the paint, painting and possibly of the painted. It is therefore syllogistically, um, is therefore uh, raised the question of beauty, its definition, as well as the very process of meaning production, dissemination and displaying. Again, arouses the question concerning the human person. For doesn't, Elise mean to say through the inscription of women as meaning producers and free speech and discourse enunciators that they too are human persons. In our current conflict-ridden world, Elise's thoughts as manifested by her art production process and concrete body of painting, singularized by unpredictability and life-giving colors, is as relevant as they are revivifying. Elise characterized, Elise's um, characterized painting is not insensible to her literary background and own engagement with literary theory. Um, here I want to underline two of the 20, 20, 20th century critical discussions concerning the very core of humankind as the latter engages with creative thoughts and expressions as well as with identity and alterity and as, vi as they find echo in Elise's works. The first one is the French post-structuralist thought of intertextuality, as proffered by philosopher Julia Cresteva. And um, the second, the French-Caribbean relation and creolization pr proposition extolled by philosopher Edouard Glissant. It is, it is true that Elise's own thoughts and painting are very much apparent to Julia Cresteva's intertextuality, in that her creations are a productivity that is, they are texts in the space of which utterances 
taken from other texts intersect and neutralize one another. Um, this said, Elise's work is not a permutation of any pre-existing creation in that the former's intrinsic new identity and meaning are independent or dependent on the new painter's female, conscious and very much a neutral outlook, gesture and goal. Given her complex dialectic vis-à-vis -vis her act of painting that resorts to a generous mobilization of multiple times, past, present and future, and means, multiple creative techniques, to the interlacing of personal history and collective traditions, and the multidimensional interrelations between different forms of art, we can see that her rewriting or repainting of old European masters' paintings instills not just the authoritative affirmation um, of a woman's speech and discourse, but also departs from a sort of Bactinian dialogic imagination to establish continuous dialogue with the past and in the present with the view of a possible transcended and highly productive and inclusive future. She inscribes herself in a definite tradition only to finally differentiate herself through the distinctive and singular subjectified voice of her personal and or own woman self. More importantly, Elise is a pictorial cannibal who does not practice simple ingurgitation, but rather performs complex mastication and regurgitation of an ingested or incorporated product to advocate for the multiplicity of perspectives, for freedom, the right to self-definition, and even for justice and balance. She shows that as a creator, the painter is also a receptor who submits their departing base to an opening reminiscent of Umberto Eco's opera Aperta stance. The continuity transpiring through her painting is no mere continuation of a tradition, but rather the acknowledgement, albeit not without questioning, of that which once existed and now also composes the present. This is why I can say that, contrary to Roland Barthes, Ancel does not propose the death of the painter. She holds it herself. Through her oil paint, she celebrates life. Contributing to the new and independent work of art, and whether it can be clearly identified or is instead op opaquely distributed underneath um, the, the new hole, the pre-existing creation is neither effaced nor belittled. It is a base constituent, thanks to which Elise creates a speech that extols inclusion and puts forth the value of the interwoven, the next to, the with, the in, and also, and the also. As thanks to her revisioning, revisioning, recreating, representing, both creations are now next to each other, with each other, and one is in the other, and also in existence. Her painting is defiantly surcharged, profoundly additive and expensive. Vis-à-vis -vis the base constituent, the new creation, appearance and ultimate identity can bewilder the profane eye and sense for linear expectations. It is very much a composite whole. This is also where, in their complex and multidimensional processes, her stance and act of painting rejoin Edouard Glissant's ideas of creolization, poetics of relation, and tout monde, all being humanistic ideas and visioning a world in which all differences would be firmly respected, thus offering an alternative to hegemonic, reductionist, monolithic, essentialist, and exclusionist views and acts. Therefore, according to Edouard Glissant, Creolization, which is one of the modes for in intricate interweaving, is embodied only by its processes and certainly not by the contents from which they work. This complex resultant of the complex interweaving, as well as the complex mode of thought and relation, constitute themselves a poetic of relation, 
as the latter is and renders outside of any fixed ideology the capacity of the imaginary to bring us to conceive the elusive totality of the extreme complexity of the world at the same time as it allows us to pinpoint some of its details and in particular to loud our own opaque singularity. All of this favors in turn the formation of a totalizing to mood, which itself is our universe as it changes and endures by exchanging and at the same time the vision we have of it. In other words, Elise's painting embodies a point of view that word, um, that, that, um, sorry, a point of view that um, would caution us to not make the mistake of believing that we are exclusively unique or that our fable is the best and our voice the highest. Maybe Elise's artistic oeuvre is arguably an embodiment of what Edouard Glissant commands as the alternative to the world's human calamities. Maybe her work is an example of creolization, a process Glissant claims the world is also bound to undergo. In any case, her postmodernist creation process unmistakably relies on a subtly nuanced reflection of all of the above and her painting testifies to the broad, complex, and inclusive interrelation that bring about beauty and ethics. Thank you. So if you understood everything, then we can go over to the reception. But I think that there might be a few questions after uh, these presentations, and we would like to give you a chance to talk to Elise and to Hanita about what they just said, and we would like to hear um, your responses to uh, experiences with uh, art of the past and ways that you can make them, can uh, make works of the past resonate with the present. From my perspective as a curator who is engaged with making sense of art that we inherit, uh, whether it reflects our own perspectives or not, I am extremely grateful for creative efforts to revitalize what, what has been passed down to us and to find creative ways of acknowledging different perspectives that are part of our world today and that might have been repressed in a world that produced these beautiful works of art that we are cherishing today. But I feel very strongly that uh, moving forward, uh, keeping the legacy alive to future generations means to acknowledge a uh, multiplicity of perspectives and find ever more creative ways of, of dealing with this heritage. So I'm excited to be able to share um, these perspectives with you today. Before we are um, opening up the conversation to everyone, I would like to invite two members of the Studies in Beauty Initiative to maybe just say a word if they want to. <laughs> Birgit Tauts and Jens Klenner are partners in crime with the Studies in Beauty Initiative. <laughs> so, um, no, what, what I found very intriguing about your work, uh, Lise, was I felt very much when you talked about how important it is for you to reconfigure narrative or in fact to get away from the, the narrative preformation that we find in these old masters that you unleashed the materiality and the pureness of color i mean i see the the symmetry and sort of the the, the formative in the sense of form impulse but i also see the 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 rawness, the pureness, the materiality of color that brings us back to something very um, original or, or pre-semantic in painting, almost. So that's, that's where I found myself being reminded of Chris Teva, for example, the pre-semantic, the, 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 the pure materiality. So that, that was, is my immediate reaction. Thank you. <laughs> that is a beautiful interpretation. I will certainly say that color is extremely important to me and that often in selecting these paintings, I really 
am not reading the narrative, but I'm looking for color that attracts me or color harmonies that attract me and dynamic compositions, and I'm entering into the, the paintings in that level. Um, it's interesting because Malievich, uh, when he was sort of formulating Russian suprematism, he was looking for a universal language, and it was color and shape. Um, and so I, I, think, I think there is something pre-verbal and universal in using color to communicate. And it's, it's a way to um, avoid the problems that can be associated with all of the divisions in our world, such such as sexism, racism, classism. It sort of, it cuts beyond and before them. Did you want to speak to that at all? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> <I do. laughs> I have a question about your process of working. And since you mentioned photography as mm -hmm. well, uh, I was thinking about the photography of paintings, actually, which is one of the times when photographers are really trying to be truthful. <laughs> mm -hmm. But as we know, it doesn't, it's not like the real thing. Um, and I wondered how you dealt with that in your process. Do you look at many reproductions? Do you feel like you have to look at the original? Uh, because things are different sizes, different colors, and there's very little to no texture depending on the paper. How have you resolved these issues in your practice? Well, it's a real luxury when you can look at the original, and that was what was so exciting about getting to work from the piece in this collection. Um, however, I, and I, I will draw in front of the originals. I never paint in front of the original because my painting process would not be safe in a museum. Um, <laughs> but uh, so, I, you know, at this point, I very much acknowledge the fact that I'm working from photographic reproductions, and that becomes part of it. And certainly with the Vermeer, the postcard I received, the color was so off in that that I, you know, went to multiple reproductions, and I, I never found anything that was exactly accurate, but at one point, I, I went with one, you know, one set, and I, and I knew that ultimately what I was painting was a digital reproduction and digital colors rather than oil colors. And I, I think that's just um, part of what we deal with now and part of this ongoing dialogue that we all really need to have about what is virtual and what is real and how do we protect what is real in our life. But, you know, once I'm painting from a reproduction, it's real. You know, then it's, it's just different. Um, Thank you. Well, thank you both for absolutely fascinating and thought-provoking um, discussions of, of your practice and your analysis of the relationship between um, uh, at least two bodies of work, but really multiple bodies of work. And along those lines, one of the things, um, Elise, that really intrigues me about um, the exhibition upstairs, and I also thank Joachim for his intellectual um, contributions to this conversation, which spans multiple generations and, and multiple individuals. Um, but one of the things that intrigues me is this notion, um, Anitha, that you um, uh, described um, with the word creolization. And I love that concept for, for many reasons. Um, and I'm interested in how the multiplicity of Elise's response to the Calvert through multiple paintings um, relates to the notion of a coming uh, of of um, uh, changing interpretations of particular cultures and this notion of um, verbal language intrigues me as a metaphor for thinking about pictorial language as well. But it it it's, it's part of this process of of translation and reconfiguration. Um, so this is sort of I guess um, a series of thoughts that I'm, I'm putting forward, but I would um, welcome, I guess, both of your thoughts on the significance of the fact that Elise has responded in multiple ways to a particular painting and what that has to do with language and, and transformation um, over time. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. 
thank you for the question, really. Um, if we do apply uh, Gleason's theory about creolization, which is basically a uh, transformation of um, pre-existing objects or bodies into different objects, different entities, bearing their intrinsic um, ethic. And he came uh, up with this theory in his process of trying to understand what took place in the Caribbean, where he originates from, and what the meaning of what took place is actually. Caribbeans are said to be neither Africans nor Europeans, but simply pale reproductions of both. So what type of ethics can that carry? And can this be uh, part of uh, the complex of beauty, given the fact that um, at the core of this, um, of this thought, uh, the Caribbean would be only pale, a pale reproduction, a vague or um, corrupted reproduction of Africa, a corrupted reproduction of, of Europe. So the question of ethics and aesthetics is at the core of um, thought processes in the Caribbean. And if I do apply um, Gleason's theory to Elise's body of work, uh, then yes, I, <laughs> I'm compelled to conclude that yes, it is a Creole oeuvre. <laughs> um, and so indeed, because of the questions pertaining to ethics that the process itself raises, and the end result as well, the resultant. So for Glissant, this would not be a um, result, but a resultant, carrying a very strong and critical epistemology. The fact that uh, through the process, Elise questions established um, ideas, established values, established codes is critical. And this places her process, the thought guiding the action into the realm of, of ethics. And all of that takes it to the realm of philosophy and of moral philosophy in particular. And the branch of philosophy that would pertain would be ontology, which is, which is the branch that, is, um, that concerns itself with uh, identity, the notion of identity. Because at the core of all of that, it seems to me I was seeing, and I still do see, that question about identity. Who am I as a painter? Who am I as a person? Who am I as a woman? And she mentioned her, uh, the multiplicity of her um, origins. Uh, her mother is from Denmark. Dan Denmark. Her, she is from um, um, a Jewish origin as well. And also she was exposed to um, uh, a set of Christian values that were determined and anchored, and she had to raise that question to herself. And so the question of identity um, is also one that uh, critically appears through the process, but also through the resultant, and that, that ties um, the process and the resultant to the notion of creolization. Um, as well. Glissant um, estimates that the world is bound to become Creole, that is, the world is bound to accept um, the reality of multiplicity, uh, but above all of the diversality, not un un universality, but diversality, through diversity. Uh, in other words, um, multiplicity is important, but not enough, as uh, entities can be together, but not necessarily acknowledge uh, their respective ethics. And it is um, when you do acknowledge um, that um, um, ethics, the ethic of the other, that you start um, conversing with uh, diversity. And uh, so to him, the world is bound to go towards that path. He reasoned in this way um, 
as a way to um, propose uh, maybe some solution to face uh, to the calamities of the world because he looked at the evolution of humanity, of humankind within humanity and different calamities humankind came up with and especially that of slavery and a uh, solution to prevent such calamities, um, genocides and so forth. Um, you mentioned sexism, racism and so forth would be to go towards that path, um, engaging seriously with diversity. And to me, this is what Elise's uh, work um, embodies as well. A dialogue uh, with, with the notion of diversity itself. I have, I have two questions, one for each, so I'm going to ask them both. And then, so for, for Elise, the one is more a question about your painterly practice. And so in the beginning, you had a lot of images that were upside down. And um, you said this is your last step of kind of with, um, removing any narrative references. So I was wondering, do you paint upside down? Or is this actually something that are, that you reverse? And the question is, um, in a recent, and forgive me for drawing the parallel, but in a, I saw a, a, retro, a Liechtenstein retrospective, which is also very much about the gesturally idea of printing. But what I was surprised to see that Liechtenstein either painted upside down with the images um, head up, so he would really remove himself from the narrative direction of the of the image, or he would put he would tilt the image into a different pictorial plane, um, especially for the purpose of removing that linearity or this narrative element of the image that he was copying or using or somehow transposing and translating. Um, the question um, to Anita: So you just talked about Glissant's idea of creolization and hybridity, but you've also referenced in your talk. Kristeva and Bartin, and I think um, one was reference to the dialogic imagination or imaginary, and the other one to um, Kristeva's idea of intertextuality. But if I understand this correctly, and I would wonder, wondered if you could tease this out a little bit in reference to Lisa's work, their um, idea of language is a different one. In, Bach, in Bartin, for example, and he does this in reference to Dostoevsky, he says the dialogic is, is especially if you have two very strong and established voices talking to each other in a paint in 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 the text or in in Kristeva and this is you know coming from as you well know from Lacanian psychology it's like and you reference the other in the very beginning and the woman as the repressed other in this very masculine discourse is an insertion into the symbolic order and therefore trying to change this um, these strike me as rather different concepts of your than your reading of hybridity and creolization, which ends up in one language. So I was wondering if you could maybe tease that out for us a little bit. I'll start because my answer is much shorter. Um, I, <laughs> I paint right side up, and then at the very end, before displaying, sometimes I turn the painting upside down. The, the notion of dialogue, of course, is important here. Um, uh, but I think we have to understand, or maybe we should define what uh, the term carries when dealing with uh, Ellis's process, because the dialogue is uh, one way. She paints from um, the old master paintings, and there is no response from them. So we cannot actually um, claim it is a dialogue, and that is that there are two references in that sense um, communicating in an active way. So that is how I approached um, this notion here. And again, that brought me back to uh, Glissant's notion of not hybridity, but creolization. Um, whereby his departure, his, his point of departure is the history of slavery, and he analyzed the other um, tragedies of, 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 uh, of humanity, um, uh, the conquest wars, um, 
uh, the Nazism, for instance, so he, genocides. But he focused on slavery. And during uh, slavery, on a plantation, there would be no dialogue either. But that the dialectic would still be there. And this is where I see a similarity uh, with Ellis's work. The dialectic would still be, still be there because you would have um, an established system that was based on um, uh, violence. And one of the forms of that violence would be the symbolic form, symbolic violence that would weigh in a lot and bring the deported Africans to react in a symbolic way to what um, the, violent, the violent system of violence was proposing. And um, the system of violence itself was not dialoguing, but imposing. So there is a dialectic here in that sense. And I, re I re um, reproached this to the process I, I thought I was deciphering in, in Elise's um, action of painting. So at that level here, I use that. Um, as far as uh, Bakhtin is concerned, of course, and Kristeva, of course, you, you're right. Um, that Bakhtin doesn't talk about dialogue per se, but about a dialogic um, um, system, if I may say. And so Kristeva um, used that um, as well, to elaborate her idea of intertextuality and um, the D of the dialogic system and the inter of the intertextuality. In Elise's case, were um, the two um, areas of their propositions that I were interested in. It doesn't mean that um, Elise's work um, can be conf conf uh, con uh, confused with the dialogic system of Bakhtin or with entirely with the Kristeva's uh, uh, intertextuality proposition as well. I'm using parts of that. And so the notion of the relation that she's establishing between two ends is what um, I am uh, by far uh, more interested in here. Thank you so much, both of you. I, this gives us a lot to think about and a lot to talk about. And I would suggest that we continue conversations with Elise and with Hanita over a glass of wine in the museum pavilion where the reception is waiting for us. And as you are enjoying the exhibition in the upstairs Markel Gallery, you should contemplate, I mean, I wish that Calvert would be sitting here on the stage. Dennis Calvert really needs to be part of this conversation. And through his painting, he is. And as you're looking at his painting, I think you will understand that as a male painter who paints the most gorgeous Madonna uh, who in the moment of her, the inception of her pregnancy, that he is indeed celebrating female creativity in his own way. And I would like to, um, rather than... <laughs> okay. So we will see you over there. Thank you very much.